Well, good morning, everyone, and it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a fabulous auditorium, this, and I last came here to see Stephen Fry give a talk, so I'm afraid, so who knows Stephen Fry is a comedian, very popular in the UK. I sadly will not be as amusing as Stephen Fry, but we'll try and give you a little bit of an overview of some aspects of, of the energy sector. And I have, I think, about 20 to 25 minutes, so clearly I can only touch on a number of things. Um, just to reiterate, I, I come from the college here. I run this thing called the Energy Futures Lab. If any of you are interested in finding out a bit more about it, we have a website. Do come and see me uh, after over drinks. Uh, we represent about 600 researchers at Imperial College that do energy research. We spend about 50 million pounds now of other people's money doing energy research. Okay, so that's what we do, and I'd be delighted to possibly talk to some of you in the future. Uh, if you want to come and do research in this area. And you can see the sorts of things that we get involved in there. So I'm going to try and pick up on some of the points that um, Lord Brown made. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the numbers around uh, global energy drivers, a little bit. Because we are in the UK, I'm afraid I am going to make reference to the UK, but many of the things I say will have resonance in uh, other countries as well. I'm, I've chosen in terms of technologies, to try and talk about the transport sector. There's, there's a multiplicity of things, uh, areas I could have covered, and, I, and I'm going to explain why, why I'm going to talk about transport as I go through. Um, so why is energy, and indeed, why do we have pressures on energy, why do we have pressures on other aspects of the world's economy? Um, and one of this, of course, is around population growth, uh, the growing, uh, growing numbers of people around the world. These are predictions, of course, that's all they are. Here's the world's population today, 6.5 billion. This is the forecast to be 8.2 billion. So significant population growth, particularly in countries like India. Okay, so we're going to put increasing stress on the demand side, simply because there are more people. Security, Lord Brown mentioned energy security. Energy security, in my view, means different things in different places. So here uh, in the UK and in other countries like the UK, it means, well, how do we shift to a uh, reduced reliance on imported uh, oil and gas? Uh, it relies on the geopolitics of energy. Okay, so this is the issue that only a few countries control the resources, the link between energy, water, and food. But if you're in a country like India, 400 million people have no access to electricity. Energy security actually is something slightly different. So it means different things in different places, but certainly it's an important driver. Urbanization, and again, Lord Brown mentioned the importance of uh, and the, the increasing trend for people to live in urban contexts. So this graph here is from Arab, and it shows you that we're, we, we have now reached the point at which the world's urban population exceeds the world's rural population for the first time. So how we use energy is in cities, how we live in an urban context is increasingly important. And of course, there's the whole uh, aspect of equity. So equity of access to energy, equity of access of consumption of energy, and the disparity of that in different countries is something that's the subject of global debate. And as young scientists and as young engineers, I hope you have a view of this, and I hope that this is something you perhaps in the course of the week you find chance to discuss in an international context. But these are the numbers. TOE is tons of oil equivalent, so it's a measure of energy use per person for the US, and here's the European Union, and the UK sits right on top of the European average. So the US is eight, the European Union is four, the China is down here towards two, and India is down here. Okay, so we've got big population growth in parts of the world which currently don't have the same energy consumption, and the challenge, of course, globally we face is how these numbers probably have to come down and how these numbers will almost certainly go up, and how we manage to achieve that in a sustainable way. So as a consequence of this, and these are predictions by the International Energy Agency, and they are predictions which don't take account of any significant change in the demand side. So it's a very important point, okay? So if it's a business as usual type prediction, what this is saying is that globally, with a growing population, and an increasing drive to, of course, quite rightly, more access to energy resources in different parts of the world, world energy use is expected to grow by 50%. Okay, so that's the business as usual scenario, and the different colors on here mean different predictions about different energy types. But this is a real challenge, and it's a challenge that you will be involved in addressing in your working lives, and, of course, in your personal lives. 
There's another consequence of this, and that is the huge amount of investment that is predicted to be made in the energy sector. Now, these numbers predate some of the financial uh, disruptions we've had in recent times, but I think while the numbers may slip in time, they're still going to be correct. This is a forecast from the World Energy Outlook. Again, it's an international energy agency for forecast. $22 trillion of investment in energy infrastructure out to 2030. Well, perhaps that's 2035. That is an enormous capital investment. So that's a great opportunity, but it, it also is a great challenge because the things we choose to invest in in that time frame will be with us for a very long time. On the whole, energy investments are long-term capital investments which last for decades. So the choices we make in the next small number of years will lock us in to our energy future. Okay, so where are we in the UK? And this is the, a UK context, but it's not untypical of a number of uh, European countries. Um, now this is a slightly complicated slide, so I'll just explain it to you. What we're showing here is some data showing from the 1970s to today. So back in the 1970s when I was 10 years old, right? And when I was your age and went to university, we were about here. This is the, so this is the change from when I was a student down to where, where I am not a student anymore. And my kids are now this age, right? So this is uh, the UK's consumption of primary energy supply. So this is our coal consumption. This is our petroleum oil consumption, essentially. And this is our gas consumption, and this is our consumption of other primary energy supplies. And what it shows you is that, perhaps not surprisingly, we have transitioned from a coal to gas for the provision of much of our electricity. Uh, we have kept our petroleum consumption fairly constant. And the black line at the top is our dependence on fossil energy. And it comes back to this hydrocarbon uh, comment, the, the hydrocarbon age that Lord Brown mentioned. The UK is 94% dependent on fossil energy today. So we have a huge challenge to move to a world where we are less reliant. There's a, a really major shift. We've managed to reduce our carbon emissions because we've moved from a very carbon-rich fuel to a lower carbon-rich fuel, but we are still a major fossil consumer. We're actually more fossil energy dependent than China in percentage terms. They have a higher carbon emissions because they have more coal dependent, but in fossil terms, they're very significantly dependent. So that's something to bear in mind. The other thing I would just draw your attention to is when we talk about energy, we tend to talk about electricity or we tend to talk about oil, uh, but actually we have to remember that it's not just about electricity and it's not just about oil, it's also the provision of heat. And in a cold, damp climate like the UK, heat is actually our biggest source of carbon dioxide. That's not just heat for homes and buildings, but it's also process heat for industry. And in the UK, at least, our biggest emitter of carbon is the heating sector, the power sector, that's electricity, is a third, and the transport sector is just under 30%. So we also, in a, over the course of the two weeks here where you're talking about energy, bear in mind that there are a number of different aspects to this that you need to, you need to think about. Okay, so I'm going to talk about transport. Of all of these things, I'm going to talk about transport, and the reasons are, one, if we look at this blue line here, this is the UK, but it's typical of many countries, the fastest growing uh, sector for energy consumption is transport. It's not necessarily the biggest consumer, but it's the fastest growing. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is it's the one sector that everyone will engage with. And they will engage with it in a very active way. And that is essentially down to the choice, the transport choices you make every day. Whether you're a consumer and buying a car, and the choice of car you buy, whether it's the choice of uh, public transport that you take, the way that you fly. So you engage extremely actively as consumers with the transport sector. When you choose to pull some electricity out of a socket, it's quite a passive process. It's not entirely apparent to you where that electricity has come from. You're conscious of it in a broader context, but transport directly impacts. So from a societal perspective, it's a really interesting area. And from a technical perspective, it's a really challenging area. So in the time I've got, that's what I'm going to focus on. Now, in the UK, what does transport mean? Well, this is million tons of oil equivalents. This is our energy.